Good day to everyone. We are with Josh Brown. Josh Brown is a local attorney, someone that, that we feel everyone needs to get to know. Josh is currently running for judge in Franklin County. So we're very, very excited to learn about Josh, what he believes, what he's done, and why he is the best candidate to get on the court so that we can have equity, justice, fairness, all the things that are important and a true legal meaning of what those words are about. So Josh, glad to have you with us this morning. Thanks for having me. appreciate it. Yeah, good stuff. So Josh, tell us a little bit about your background. I mean, it's your story to tell, not mine. And you know, h- how you got here. You know, what's, what's the securitist route? Nobody gets here in a straight line. So, so tell us a little bit about Josh Brown. Yeah, that's right. Not a straight line. Grew up just south of Columbus. And uh, when I was 17, I joined the United States Army. And so that was before my senior year of high school. Wow. And then right after I graduated, I joined, I went into the military, served for eight years, started off, been a year in Korea. And I was at Camp Casey, which is pretty close to the DMZ up there. And then went to Fort Bliss in Texas, El Paso. And mm-hmm. Then after I got out of the Army, I, well, I went to Ohio State and went into the military reserves, the Army reserves. I got deployed to Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2004, and I served there. Were you in Iraq? I was in Kuwait the whole year. Kuwait, okay. Yeah. yeah. So you, you've seen a lot of the world. I mean, Korea, Texas, which some people say it's its own country, right? <laughs> Especially yeah. Fort Bliss on the border. Yeah. And yeah, and then, then Kuwait. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You're, you're well traveled. Yeah. And then when I was in the reserve, I started at Ohio State, graduated from Ohio State in 2006, and then went to the University of Toledo for law school. Go Rockets. Yep. Almost beat Notre Dame the other day. <laughs> <laughs> and then. Came back to Columbus, worked at the Ohio General Assembly after law school, and then I started practicing law shortly after that. Started off doing bankruptcy work and did that for several years. While I was practicing bankruptcy part-time at first, and I was executive director at the Ohio Association, public safety directors, and a representative for Ohio Municipal League, so I was an advocate for them at the General Assembly, and then started practicing law for full time. And uh, I'm a lawyer now does a business counsel. So I represent small businesses. I have about 50 or so small businesses in my book of clients. And I do everything from, you know, the day to day business counsel, writing contracts, sometimes just phone calls, what should I do type situations, Mm -hmm. all the way to full litigation. So I have a number of matters pending that are civil litigation. And for example, a few weeks ago, we filed a lawsuit against Ohio Highway Patrol. I represent a tow truck company that felt that, that something was done illegal to them. And I am uh, work as a partner at a law firm, but I'm what you call of counsel, mm-hmm. and which means I'm independent from the law firm and I use the law firm's resources. Yep. And so I'm not a sole practitioner, but I have some of the benefits of the independence of being a sole practitioner. And the reason that's really helpful is because you'll notice like in the General Flynn situation, he hired a big law firm to represent him in his case. And the FBI was the, the police in the case, the investigators in the case, and the U.S. attorneys were prosecuting. And the big law firm he had had long-term relationships with the FBI and long-term relationships with the U.S. Attorney's Office. And that was what they were really selling was those relationships. Well, they cut a deal with the FBI and the Attorney's Office. And he ended up pleading guilty to something that he really believes he didn't do and something that he, didn't, he shouldn't have to plead guilty to. So he f- eventually he fired that large firm and hired Cindy Powell. And Cindy Powell is a, is a sole practitioner. Uh-huh. And so she went after the prosecutors really hard because she's not, you know, trying to maintain a revolving door with the FBI or any of those types of entities. And she didn't have that sort of conflict of interest where she's trying to sell her relationship, you know, to these agencies. Mm-hmm. And so she had no fear in charging the prosecutors with, an improper prosecution, improper activities like 
coercing him into pleading guilty and sort of, you know, there's a, a allegation that they threatened his son. So, so the government doesn't always do things the right way is what I'm kind of <laughs> hearing here. <laughs> that's, that's correct. And okay. so what I sell to my clients is representation of the client and sort of a fearless attitude towards representing the client and doing what the client needs and getting what the client needs done without that interest in trying to maintain a good relationship with the attorney general or U.S. attorney's office or whoever it is. So you'll take on the big guy. Yeah. Like I said, I, I've sued the state of Ohio several times and we're in the middle of a big lawsuit where I sued the uh, department of health and now I'm up against the highway patrol. Isn't that kind of, I mean, isn't that intimidating to go up? I mean, the average lawyer, I wouldn't think would want to go up against agencies or governmental entities that are that big. What's, why do you do this? I mean, it sounds like you got an inner strength or something that brings this, brings this forward. So I, ha- I actually felt the exact same way when I first started practicing law. And I got into bankruptcy because I wanted a part-time practice. And within the bankruptcy world, there's a civil litigation sort of sub-practice called adversary claims okay. within the bankruptcy practice. And that's when a bankruptcy case goes from being an administrative case to being a dispute. And I had my first dispute very early in my practice. Okay. I mean, only a few months in. And for the first time in my career, I'm standing in front of a federal judge, you know, trying to make my arguments. And uh, on the other side was West Banco, and they had two attorneys assigned to the case. I had been practicing maybe two months, <laughs> maybe two, wow. three months. And you're out there by yourself in the big yeah, ocean. Yeah, I'm representing a guy, and he couldn't even pay me. And the other two lawyers on their side, I mean, I, I looked up their credentials. They had both been practicing 30 years, so... Anyways, I frankly, I just ran circles around them. You know, I, I knew I was right, and I had the law on my side. I did. I worked really hard to make sure I was ready. I had some very experienced people help coach me along. Mm-hmm. And as well as that went, I really started to reduce my fear of how big the law firm is or whether they work for this, you know, the attorney general or U.S. attorney or whatever. Over time, I learned not only not to be afraid of them, but not to overestimate them either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, they can't rewrite the laws. So if the law is on your side, it's on your side. There's nothing they can do about that. They will try. I don't do uh, any criminal, so I don't, I don't deal with that sort of... It, that's kind of its own world, I think. Yeah, I mean, the I, guys I, that do that are very, very focused. and Yeah, I don't deal with any and, plea bargaining kind of stuff. What we deal with is different forms of leverage, and they they do have a lot of leverage being a government entity, and every once in a while they'll exercise it, but what I have found is that if you actually do a really good job on your filings, you do a good job in front of the judge, mm-hmm. they can have 10 attorneys on their side who are all the best attorneys in the world, but at the end of the day, they get their time to make their arguments, I get my time, and if I'm if I'm doing a good job, it doesn't mean I'm going to win, but we give our client a mm-hmm. very good shot at winning. So to this point, I'm not only not afraid of big firms or government lawyers, but I'm actually eager to take them on because I've come to believe that uh, I'm a better attorney than most of them. And <laughs> and I I know I can beat them when the law's on my side. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that's what we always hope. We always hope the law prevails. We are a nation supposedly of, of laws. You know, moving in that, because there's, there's a theme here that's kind of interesting. You have a unique perspective coming out of bankruptcy on how, how debt can hurt people, help people, be mismanaged. Simultaneously, yeah. you do a lot of work with small business. That, that's something that that's, I think is very much an American question right now that's not being talked about. Small business. Are we supportive of small business or is small business right now under a undue threat that it may or may not even recognize for its own survival with big companies like Amazon, Google. You know, it, it seems like the, the, the shoe store at the end of the street isn't there anymore. Um, are we on the right track? Are we on the wrong track uh, in terms of what you're seeing in your current practice to be supportive of small business people? And if not, you know, what, what's wrong? The answer is that we're not 
supportive of small businesses as much as we not only should be, but must be in order to have a prosperous nation. We actually, you and I talked about this yesterday, Sean, and I really kind of something I've been thinking about that we talk about the middle class and how important it is for a nation to have a strong middle class. Mm -hmm. And, but we've largely defined middle class by the amount of money people are making. And, but we should also define the middle class by the amount of independence that they have. Mm -hmm. And in my bankruptcy practice, I've consulted literally thousands and thousands of people. And as I've consulted them, I almost always talk to them about their job and uh, or what they're doing. And at times I have found that there are people who have never thought about starting a small business. Mm -hmm. And so I will use a particular client as an example. And he's authorized me to talk about this case. Okay. Because it was such an interesting situation. So he, he was a guy who's very, very shy, inner city black guy, very poor, but he got a job vacuum cleaning people's houses. Okay. Some some business hired him to do that. And he came in with his mom, and his mom did most of the talking because he was so shy. And because he was my client and not her, I really tried to get him talking. And when he was talking, he was said, you know, I am doing this vacuum cleaning stuff, and I enjoy it, but I just don't see it as a long-term thing. You know, I'll probably quit at some point. And I said, have you ever thought about starting your own vacuum cleaner business. Mm -hmm. No one in his life had ever asked him or told him he could do something like that. Wow. To him, the idea was if you want to make a little bit of money, you either, based on you know, kind of the environment he was from, you kind of steal it, you sell drugs, or you get a job. And to get a job was kind of at the bottom of the list in his, from the way he told me. And, but I said, did you know there's another option? You could get a small business loan, which I'll, I will help you get. Because what I want him to do is be a successful small businessman. And I, it's for his own good, number one. But number two, when he needs a lawyer, he'll hire me. Sure. You know, so there's a... We all win together, right? Yeah, there's a mutually beneficial situation here. And so um, I said, I'll show you how to get a small business loan. And we can get you, you know, for maybe 10, 15 grand, we can get you a truck, a van or a truck and, a, and that vacuum cleaner system that you're using. You already know how to use it. You know how to maintain, maintain it. You've been doing it for other people. So did you ever think about doing it for yourself? Mm -hmm. And he had just never even, never even crossed his mind. And wow. I said, I'll show you. And I got out my, so I have my computer set up so that he can see my screen. Okay. I have a screen that points towards him. I go on Secretary of State's website, show him the, the paperwork filing for starting a business. Go on the IRS website, show them the, the system for setting up your EIN number, which is a social security number for a business. I tell them, you walk to the bank with those two documents, they're going to open up a bank account for you. You'll be officially a business. And then I showed them, I mean, I literally, I went to Google Ads and said, here's where you can advertise, here's how much it costs, <laughs> you know. And I said, so, so you give this guy A to Z. Yeah. In this a way to start a business yeah. and not be a person who is stealing from society or taking from society, but now he's giving to society. Yeah, and the thing that I think was most attractive to him was the independence that it would give him. You mm -hmm. know, he can, you know, after... Can, can I use the word freedom there? Yeah, freedom. It, yeah. I, I think it's yeah. independence and freedom are yeah. so related, interrelated. Yeah. Okay, Yeah, Good. so... When you start a business like that, you know, you start off with some advertising and you'll probably have an advertising budget going forward, but eventually it's all word of mouth. You do a good job a few times, they'll tell their friends. And for the most part, you'll be running off a of word of mouth within a year or two. You can, if you do a great <clears throat> job for people, I've, I tell people in every business, including, including the real estate world, I said, you won't have to spend any money advertising. They'll yeah. come find you. Yeah. And I said, I took them to canva.com and I said, here are templates and this is like ten. This is like a ten dollars service. It's not expensive at all. Mm -hmm. These are templates. You can build your flyers, and you can order them right here. So go on there, spend thirty bucks or so, and print out a hundred flyers. Go okay. door to door. You know, do a little bit. You're gonna have to do a little advertising, a little door drops in the beginning. But I bet I said I guarantee if you do a good job, you work hard, you're gonna be cranking in in a little while. And so I think that it's not to answer your question. A lot of my representation is suing the government because they're doing unfair things to small businesses. 
So okay. I, my lawsuit against the Department of Health was because, uh, or actually it wasn't against the Department of Health, it was against the uh, Department of Liquor Control. It was because they're acting outside their jurisdiction and issuing a citation to my client. And my lawsuit against the Highway Patrol is because they were uh, author- acting outside their authorization in depriving my client of some property. And so there's no doubt in my mind that from the regulatory standpoint, from the government standpoint, they have not done enough to support small businesses. But also, it really isn't hard to start a small business. And it is very challenging to successfully run a small business. But it's supposed to be challenging because... Mm -hmm. It's not for everybody. There is, in a manner of speaking, it's not for everybody. But in a manner of speaking, it is for everybody too because... Good point. You, if you, if you want independence that comes from having your own business, anybody can do it that really wants to do it, but you, you have to want to do it. Yeah, you got to be committed. Yeah, because what's going to happen is you're going to be challenged in ways that you were never challenged before. And there's a different vocation in running a business than there is whatever product or service you're selling. So if you're a plumber and you start a plumbing business, you're not just a plumber anymore. You're a plumber and you're a businessman. And eventually, you know, once you're hiring other people to do the plumbing, then you're just a businessman. So that's a different vocation. So you have to, you do have to learn a new vocation, but it's to say that it's worth it is the understatement of the century (laughs) because, because not only do you develop these competencies when you start and run a small business, you, you develop not only the vocation of running a business, but your mind and your body and your life all begin to develop those competencies and those strengths and those strengths will make you stronger in life from a psychological standpoint a physical standpoint because you're not dependent on other people the business you work for it can provide a lot for you but it can also be a crutch okay and i'll tell you how this actually really becomes a problem because how many people today are angry about covid stuff or masking stuff And they want to leave their job because of the way it's being treated. Or they're angry about, you know, sort of left-wing or even right-wing policies in their company. They just don't agree with what management is doing. They don't agree with what the corporate board is doing. And they'd like to leave, but there's too much at stake. Uh huh. They'd have to leave their salary. They'd have to leave their pension. I know what it feels like because I made that decision myself. And I I will tell you that I stuck with my job at a a mid-sized company, mid-sized corporation. It was a nonprofit corporation. I stuck with them because I had a decent salary and I had great benefits. Mm-hmm. And if I go out on my own, I have to find my own retirement plan. Yep. I have to find my own health care plan. And mine was $350 a month, and that's cheap. <laughs> you know? okay. Yeah. I got to take care of myself. Like if, a, if I get sick, I got to have a plan. You know, so I got health insurance, you know, the short term disability type insurance, you know. So, you have to take a lot of responsibility and you don't get to say, I can't come into work because I'm sick. There's a lot of things that are on your shoulders, but if you are a small business person running your own business, you don't get to say, I'm just sick of the boss's policies. (laughs) Sure. I don't like the way this company is being run. If it's not being run right, it's because you're not running it right. You know, Mm -hmm. I think that's a big problem in the United States today that, um, not enough people are thinking like small business people and not willing to take that risk to be an entrepreneur. And we glorify that. And I think we rightly glorify it because it is such a risk. And we know most businesses fail, but most businesses fail because there's a lack of commitment to the business. Okay. I don't think it fails because it was a bad business idea or anything like that. I think that what you have to do not just in business, but in life is it's called burning the ships. The expression comes from the Spanish conquistador was, you know, he landed in somewhere in South America. And when he got there, the captain burnt all the ships that they came over on. And the crew was like, are you crazy? (laughs) You know, we need Mm -hmm. these ships. Right. And he said, we're either going to conquer this land or we're going to die trying. (laughs) So, yeah. And that's how a business works is You're either going to, you have to put yourself in a position where you are fully committed. And when you put yourself in a position where this has to work, it will work Mm -hmm. when you put yourself in that position. When you dip one toe in, there's, you do want to dip one toe in, because I'll give you an example. I'm consulting a teacher right now who wants to start a tutoring business. Okay. And I said, you know, eventually you have to burn those ships. But but for right now, 
let's just start with one student. You know, after school, on the weekends, tutor one student. Get paid for it. Start your own bank account. Start your LLC. And if you think you can make a business out of it at that time, then that's the time to burn the ships. You know? Yeah. So dabble in it at first, but don't, make a, don't try to make a career out of dabbling. Unless that's specifically your goal. Like if your goal is to supplement your income by dabbling, that's, that's one thing. But if your goal is the independence and the strength and the power that comes from being a small business person, then you can't, you can't just keep dabbling forever. Someday you got to walk away from that job and there's going to be a few months period of time there where you got to make the money. <laughs> you got to make it work. Yeah. Get in it. Get in it to win it. Yeah. And then the day will come where as that business starts to grow, then... Uh, you'll make more money and then you'll have more choices and more options. And that's when you start talking about developing a niche. I'm in that kind of position right now where I'm a small business counselor, but I can really represent any type of small business. And I'm probably in a position in my career where it's time to start looking at niches because I have several clients coming from different areas, especially construction industry and tow truck industry. Those are two businesses where I'm, I'm getting a lot of clients and I'm starting to think maybe it's time to sort of hold myself out as being a niche provider. Anyways, so to answer your question, yeah, the government needs to do a lot more for small businesses, but also people need to be courageous and understand everything that comes, you know, with, uh, I, I don't want to discourage anybody from seeking out small business as a career. Yeah. You're running for the court. Tell me about that a little bit. So what made you want to do this and what what do you bring? Is there, is there a unique skill set or a perspective that you bring to, to the position that you're seeking? I was approached by the party leaders and, and the Republican Party and asked to run. And I think that in this court, there is a lot of things that I can't control. But as a judge, I can control one courtroom. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can control how I handle the cases that are in front of me. And I believe that there is a lot of things that are not being handled well. And so one of the things, for example, that I really want to do a good job at is on the criminal side, making that decision between whether somebody needs to be incarcerated or whether somebody made a mistake mm -hmm. and, you know, we can cut them some leeway. And I think I have a lot of background and knowledge. My brother was, you know, really heavy into drugs when he was young and almost died. In fact, I think he literally his heart stopped beating for a while. Wow. So you've, you, you've seen what some of this stuff does to people and families yeah. and yeah. you Grew can, up you can relate. Grew up around it and saw it and my brother really suffered from it. And my brother was an example of somebody who on paper, he had committed so many crimes and done so many things wrong that it was maybe easy to believe that he was more on the side of someone who needs to be incarcerated. But really what he was, was somebody who made some mistakes and uh -huh. it's hard to it's hard to see that but uh, that's something that i think that i can do very very well because i i can tell the difference having yeah. been in a position where i myself had to ask for some leeway from a court <laughs> you know yeah. when i was 19 years old i had a drinking and driving incident and asked the court for leeway it was the first time and to date the only time i've ever been in front of a judge mm -hmm. in, in terms of being in front of a judge for something i did wrong okay and so I, I told the judge it was a mistake. It was a one-time thing, and they reduced the charge and then eventually expunged it because I proved that. Yeah. You know, and so... Uh, um, Sometimes good people get in not good situations. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that there's a, a lack of respect for law enforcement that's really pronounced that's going on. And I think that when you're making that judgment the law enforcement's perspective can be very, very important because they understand as well as anybody, the person who's coming in there. And right now, I don't think that they're being listened to the way they ought to be. And that doesn't mean anything a cop says is to be taken as truth. It just means that they are on the street and they know whether a person is a danger to society or not. And so at the very least, you just need to listen to what they say. So I've been endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police, and, I'm, and I take enormous, enormous pride in that endorsement. And when I sat with them, I told them I'm not making any promises. Police won't get any special treatment from me, but I will listen to you, and I'll always treat you fairly, and I'll respect your knowledge of what's going on on the street. And they actually asked me a really interesting case study. They said, what would you do if some prisoner refuses to go to court? And we have to go in there and drag him out of the you know, jail cell. 
Hmm. It's and, interesting. I hadn't thought of that before. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's a real real occurrence, right? Yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah. And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, that's a, a fact-specific question, but I'll tell you how I'll handle it. I'm going to ask the prisoner to give me his side of the story. I'm going to ask the police officer to give me their side of the story. And then we'll make a judgment based on the facts as as testified to. And if I find the police officer's testimony is not credible, then I might be leaning more towards the prisoner's side. And if the prisoner's story is not credible. But what I won't do is jump to a judgment. Yeah. And or a pre a pre judgment. I won't have a prejudice. And I have I'm extremely, extremely upset that that has happened many occasions and there's one occasion in particular I don't even want to bring it up because it's it's a very prominent judge in Ohio. <laughs> and okay. this judge decided to write a letter based on solely on a prison prisoner's word. And the prisoner said that this prison guard had called him a bad word and maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but I'm not just taking the prisoner's word for it. Sure. And if a police officer comes in and says the prisoner punched him, I'm not just taking the police officer's word for it. Yeah. Everybody who's involved has a right to testify. If you choose not to testify, that's one thing. But I want to hear everybody's testimony as to what it is, develop a credible record. And right now, this idea that the police are out to get people, and those of us who lived through the 90s, we know what it takes to to fight to fight and defeat violent crime. Mm -hmm. In the 1990s, there was proactive policing, Rudy Giuliani and the broken windows theory. Which is, if you go after the small crimes, the broken windows, the graffiti, the vagrancy, then you won't have the big crimes. Because it's that process of committing small crimes that leads to the commission of big crimes. Yeah. And a lot of these people that are anti-police right now, when there's a threat in their neighborhood, the first thing they do is call their their police department. Mm -hmm. And when they want somebody thrown out of a city hall meeting, who's throwing them out? They call the police in to throw them out. There's a guy up in Worthington right now who says, you know, if you don't agree with him, you're a white supremacist. And they threw out their police officer. They had a their, what's called a SRO. Do you remember the? Yeah, yeah, school resource school officer. School resource officer. They threw the resource officer out of their school and did it on this idea that it was, I guess, offensive to somebody. But I guarantee that when they want protection, <laughs> they're going to call the police. And number two, if you are intimidated by a police officer, first of all, you should be a little intimidated by them because it's not their job to be your buddy and your pal. Yeah. Their job is to enforce the law, mm -hmm. not recommend that you follow it, not to point it out when you break it, but to make you follow it. Yep. And so they're not there to be your friend, but... If you want to understand what a police officer does and why you shouldn't be offended by them and why you should respect them, the best way to do that is to be around them. Mm -hmm. And the education system is the best place for that. And I would like to have police officers in every school, if for nothing else, so they can talk to people. And like I said, this isn't about policy. I'm not advocating anything about any particular policy. All I'm saying is that Police officers deserve to be heard and to be respected as much as anybody else. And having a prejudice towards them, or really a prejudice towards anybody, is wrong categorically. Mm -hmm. The idea that it's okay to be prejudiced towards some people and not other people is deeply offensive, not only to me, but to the law in the United States. And so I'm not in this business of picking and choosing who it's okay to have prejudice towards. Makes sense. Yeah, I always say, you know, justice is supposed to be blind. I hope it is. And legislators are the ones that are supposed to supposed to fix those problems. Do you think, let's talk about City of Columbus a little bit. Let's talk about Central Ohio, Franklin County, I guess. Let's talk about all of that. A lot of, a lot of strife. There's a lot of imbalance, perhaps. What can the bench do? What, what can a judge do to participate in the solution? Not to play into the problem, but to participate in the solution. Well, actually, the answer is that a judge can do a lot, and I'll, and I'll list some of those things. And it's interesting that that's not the answer a lot of other judges have given. <laughs> they say, well, I, I know that. I'm beholden to the law, and I have to do the system, and I have to do this, and I'm, I'm this and that. And I just think that's complete cop-out. So the number one thing that anybody can do, especially a judge, is to set 
an example. Like the principle is to clean your own house before you start telling other people to clean their houses. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, and Jesus said this the best, there was this process of condemning a prostitute and all these Pharisees and all these leaders, all these politicians were saying, you know, that we should condemn this, this lady. And Jesus said, let he who is without sin throw the first stone at her. That is a principle that has been abandoned by large segments of our society and very, very wrongly so. The first thing you should do in life is get your own house clean. And I don't care if you're a judge or whether you're a single mother of four in the ghetto or in a trailer park or or if you're some suburban rich person or a suburban poor person, it doesn't matter. Uh-huh. You the best thing you can do in this world is set the example, do things right in your own house. So the first thing I'm going to do as a judge is make sure that that courtroom and every case before me is done right. And once I feel that we're at a certain point with that, and then maybe I can hold that up as an example of how it ought to be done. I'm not one to go around telling other people how to do their business, so I don't plan on walking to other people's, other judges' courtrooms and telling them how to do their business. Uh-huh. I don't plan on telling the lawyers or the prosecutor how to do their job as long as they're not violating the laws. But what I want to do is set an example. And if everybody sets the example, cleans their own house first, and of course the golden rule, treat other people as you want to be treated, Mm -hmm. then that is the key. What is not the key, what is not the way to do it, is to go around telling everybody how virtuous you are and how they ought to be like you and how they're not believing in science if they don't agree with you and waving your little virtue signals and telling everybody what they ought to be doing, and this is for the common good, and all this crap. Mm-hmm. Just worry about yourself first. <laughs> and yeah, then when your yeah. business is taken care of, then you can come talk to me. And I think we all saw these people that are telling everybody they need to mask up, and they're not wearing masks. You know, like Hollywood is really big on that, and it's been one little party after the other in Hollywood where they're not wearing masks. One of the great examples was the Emmys, where all the staff and all the people working there are wearing masks. Yeah. But none of the celebrities are wearing masks. And my view is that if the government's going to order us to wear masks, fine, but everybody needs to do it. Yeah. And <laughs> not, not just the servants. Well, and you got like Chris Rock was vaccinated, just came out a day or so ago saying, hey, I've, I've got COVID. The breakthrough, the breakthrough infection thing. It seems like there's still a lot of mystery, still a lot of unknowns as to the efficacy of a lot of this stuff. So I love statistics. I think they give us meaning and reason and project trends and reality. Seems like that's that's lacking a bit to the public because I search for it regularly to have an understanding. And I know in criminology, I mean, it's often statistically based. It, you know, they look at, at the aggregates, at the macros, not necessarily at the person who maybe is stealing for subsistence or stealing that loaf of bread to feed their family or that, that medicine, you know, it, it's a human business, I think. And, uh, you know, you seem to be somebody that really seems to be in touch with that, particularly with that background of knowing small business, growing up, serving our country, um, just, just so many wonderful things. We probably need to go ahead and start getting our final thoughts in. What else do you want to talk about or tell us about Josh Brown that we haven't heard so far? Because I think we got a really good flavor so far about about the depth of who you are sure i'm as a candidate i can't fix the judicial system if i get elected Mm -hmm. but i can guarantee you that there will be one courtroom where everybody will be treated fairly everybody will be treated equally regardless of color their skin their sex and not only that but i'll listen to their stories so if being a black person, for example, is relevant to your story, then I, I will listen to that and mm-hmm. take that into consideration. But I'm not letting you off just because you're black. Yeah. And I'm not letting you off just because you're white. Mm-hmm. And I'm not letting you off just because your dad makes donations or whatever it is, you know. And it's going to be solely based on those facts, on the facts of your case and the testimony presented, and whether it's credible or not. And so I can't guarantee you that this is going to solve all the problems in the world, but it'll solve it in one courtroom. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So I'm running against a guy named uh, Jim O'Grady, mm-hmm. and uh, there's a lawsuit that is just been settled on August 2nd, and I guarantee you that I will never be sued for the things that he was sued for, and I will not cost the city a half a million dollars in legal expenses and settlement costs for the things that happened in that in that lawsuit. And I'm just saying that as a matter of fact, I think that if you're in front of Joe Grady, he may be the fairest guy ever. I've never been in front of him before, but I think it's worth noting that I have an opponent who, in my opinion, should resign. Yeah, I guess carrying on with that just a little bit, I have not, I mean, I saw on the internet what that settlement was. I didn't see it in the in the local paper, <laughs> which was surprising because it's a, you know, I think it was around a quarter million dollars for some things that were, I mean, the Me Too movement would not have tolerated that. There's a number of movements that the, you know, that the progressive folks have had out there. I guess I was a little shocked. I, I, I shocked might even not. That, that's not even enough of a word to think that they would tolerate that out of a person. I've seen many people resign, be fired, lose their positions of public trust or private trust in the private marketplace for far, far, far less. Is yeah. it appropriate to chat on that a little bit, or yeah, sure? Because okay. uh, I mean, I don't want to get into anything that's inappropriate, but yeah, I, I mean, if you read it, if it's if it's fifty percent true. It's, it's, it's astonishing. I'm going to state merely the facts because both as an attorney and as a, as a judicial candidate, I'm not allowed, nor do I have any desire to make people lose confidence in the judiciary. Yes. And so I have no, and I don't think that Judge O'Grady's situation ought to cause people to lose confidence in the judiciary generally. And, but as a matter of fact, he was uh, sued and the city of Columbus had to pay for his defense in 2015 for hostile work environment for women. And then he was sued again in 19, 2019 for the same thing. He was elected twice as a Republican and sued in both incidences as a Republican, a Republican-endorsed judge. And he switched to being a Democrat last year. I believe it was 2020 when he switched. Mm-hmm. And as a matter of fact, on August 2nd, that lawsuit was settled at a settlement cost of $210,000, which is taxpayer money because Columbus is self-insured, so it was not an insurance company that paid. It was City of Columbus taxpayer dollars. And I would estimate the legal expenses to be in the probably $200,000 range, but that is a personal estimate. It's a guess. Estimate, yeah. yeah. Okay. It could be anywhere from zero to a pretty large amount of money. So it's two hundred and ten thousand dollars plus the legal expenses, and it only settled right before trial. I mean, the trial was scheduled for September. Okay. So he had gone through the summary judgment phase, and it was still deemed by the judge something that should go to trial. So potentially half a million dollars because somebody allegedly a lady named did some Andrea, very naughty things. A lady who worked for the court named Andrea Boxill. Okay. Again, I'm only stating facts here. Sure, sure, They're sure. all publicly available facts. A lady named Andrea Boxhill, she accused Judge O'Grady of creating a hostile... So this wasn't a dirty joke situation. This wasn't a come-on sexual type of a situation. This was a hostile work environment situation. Mm-hmm. And she alleged, and she's never proven it in court, but she alleged, accused him of treating women differently and referring to women with dirty names... And and doing it on a regular basis and and casually. So, those allegations have never been proven in court. Yep. But rather than contest them, the defense, which would be Judge O'Grady and his lawyers, decided to settle it. Okay. With the city of Columbus paying her two hundred and ten thousand dollars. So if I go out and do some things like that, would the city of Columbus pay for me? <laughs> Well, if you work for the city of Columbus, yeah, but not not if you don't work for the city of Columbus. Okay, just just wondering. I mean, I'm a taxpayer, so I thought you know maybe I would get the same kind of break if I decided to go out and 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 do those naughty things to people. So okay, you know, well, I, I agree with what you're saying that most employers, especially private employers, are not going to support you the way the city of Columbus supported Judge O'Grady. But that is a 
No, I would fire anybody that worked for me that did that, that did that stuff, or we'd put them on leave and say, "Hey, you can't do yeah. what you do until we get to the bottom of this," because human yeah. rights and dignity are kind of important where I work. Yeah, the way it works in a a lawsuit against a private company is as an attorney representing the plaintiff suing the company over a hostile work environment. I got to show that the company has some sort of liability before I can get at the company, but the company's insurance may cover that employee regardless of whether I get to the employer or not. Mm -hmm. And so since Columbus is self-insured, that's like if you sued a a typical township, you would not be getting taxpayer money from the township. You'd be getting it from their insurance company. Okay. But really big entities, if they prove certain things, then they're allowed to be self-insured. Sure. And city of Columbus, its own insurance company. So they're covering him as a matter of liability for him as a, an agent of the city of Columbus. I'm not sure if you call him an employee, but he's certainly an agent of the city. And it sounds like, sounds like the Harvey Weinstein deal though. I mean, he worked, he had his own company. They paid for him to cover up or to defer the problems that he ultimately, you know, I think, I think ultimately this guy was, was bad news and they just kind of slid it under the rug, slid it under the rug again, slid it under the rug again. And eventually it crawled out and reared its ugly head to where where they finally had the, 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 the ladies come out, the women, and say, hey, this, this really happened. Is, that, is, is, there a, is there a problem of complicity when you allow somebody to continue who has those kind of allegations, or do you need to just let that process continue on and hope that the person, cross your fingers, that it, it was a, you know, something that just happened over a period of maybe five years and then it stops forever? Well, I'm... I'm limiting myself to only stating publicly known facts about the case, Mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that the Harvey Weinstein analogy is appropriate for me to make. Okay. You can make whatever analogy you want, and I think that Judge O'Grady— I'm I'm talking in hypotheticals here. Yeah, he he has a right to defend himself, and I'm sure that you'd be glad to let him come in here and talk about the case with you if— Yeah, uh, but nonetheless, But nonetheless, as a matter of public record, another judge at the court— Sure. Wrote a memo oh. saying that Judge O'Grady was exposing the the courts to liability hmm. for what he was doing. So I think that might answer your question to the extent that it was tolerated. I, I don't think it was tolerated. I think that there was concern among people at the court about what was going on, and it was expressed in writing, and that was admitted at court as documentary evidence of what was of liability that another judge had said he's exposing us to liability. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. I, I don't even know how to, res- I, I'm sitting here. Okay. I'm pretty good at coming back with things. I don't know what to come back with well, on the that. Amazing but... thing is that the, Denver, <laughs> the amazing thing is this is going away from facts into my opinion. Okay, I cannot okay. believe the Democrat party endorsed him. That's a, that is a black mark on the Franklin County Democrat party till the end of history. Yeah. They can never have moral high ground. On anybody when you're going to en- endorse somebody with that going on. And uh, again, maybe he didn't do it. He, that was never proven in court. It was settled out of court. And I'm guessing, and I bet you a million dollars that he settled with an agreement to not admit any liability. So maybe he didn't do it. And maybe this is all very much unjust for him. But I just don't think the Republican Party of Frank Kennedy would ever endorse someone in that situation. See, I quite, and I take a little bit different spin on that. I think that when a public figure is accused of a heinous situation like that, that they should have, they should not be allowed to settle. They should have to go through a full public vindication uh, event, maybe a trial or some, something else. But the public trust needs to be 100% restored, not 96% restored or 49% restored, 100% mm-hmm. that this did or did not happen. Because the other side is it also tells people who falsely accuse people that it's going to go the full gamut and you're not going to get a big fat payday because you made something up. You're going to now be in a liability situation. I, I think that's one place where our system doesn't necessarily bring the truth forward it lets the truth be swept under the rug and we end up with you know we end up with these with these people who will continue to prey on other people over and over again because the system let it do it so you know whether it's clergy scandals or or what have you you know school teachers that that get passed from district to district 
it's something that we're going to have to deal with. And that's that's a conversation for our legislators. I mean, we're going to have to talk to them about, you know, making the laws a little more proper. So yeah. our children so, and our and our women and our and our men are not exposed to predatory situations. Yeah. And so as an officer of the court and as an attorney, one of my most important duties is to help build faith in the justice system in Ohio and the United States. And I do think that you need a good judge who can look at a case and have an idea of the injustice that results from false accusations, but also the injustice that results from if the accusations are true. You know, So you can't be a judge who's biased towards plaintiffs or biased towards defendants. It's got to be on the merits, on the facts, on the evidence presented, on a case-by-case basis. And yeah, I think that's, that's what's important. Okay. Well, good stuff. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Josh, anything we missed real quick? And if, if not, it was great to have a little bit of time for people to get to hear who you are, what you're up to, how you're helping so many people in so many ways. And we wish you all the luck in the world. All right. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. So Attorney Josh Brown running for a judge in Franklin County, Ohio. And my website is votebrownforjudge.com. And if you want to call and talk to me, 614-284-4394. Hey, thanks for giving us your time to listen. You've been listening to Fill in the Blank with Sean Parker, where we talk about the issues of politics and the geopolitical marketplace, as well as economics. If you like our channel, please subscribe to us at Fill in the Blank on YouTube. And be sure to listen every week as we come back to you with some of the most thought-provoking people of the day. And learning is always the key to what we're trying to do.